January 16, 2003. Columbia rockets skyward on what should have been a routine mission. Seven astronauts bound for discovery, their shuttle's legacy stretching back to 1981. Yet just 81 seconds after launch, a chunk of foam slams into the left wing at nearly 500 miles per hour, sparking a chain of events no one on board can see. The story called, How Did This Happen? The Columbia re-entry tragedy isn't about a single moment of failure, but a hidden wound, quietly growing while experts and engineers debate the unimaginable. How does a silent impact in a bright blue sky unravel into one of spaceflight's darkest days? The answer, and the stakes for everyone, are far more disturbing than you might imagine. Columbia was never just another shuttle. She was the first to carry astronauts into orbit in 1981, a machine built in Palmdale, California, at a time when reusable spaceflight was still a dream. Over two decades, Columbia logged more days in space than any other orbiter, carrying satellites, laboratories, and the hopes of a generation that saw the shuttle as a bridge to the future. By 2003, she had been modernized, refitted, and trusted with missions that demanded both endurance and precision. STS-107 was no exception. The crew for this mission came from different corners of the globe and every walk of life, united by a single purpose. Commander Rick Husband, a test pilot from Amarillo, Texas, led the team. Willie McCool, the pilot, was a naval aviator and engineer. Michael Anderson, payload commander, brought expertise in physics and a quiet determination. Mission specialists included David Brown, a Navy flight surgeon, Laurel Clark, also a physician, and Kalpana Chawla, an aerospace engineer born in India, who had already made history as the first Indian-born woman in space. The seventh seat belonged to Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli astronaut, who carried with him the memory of his mother, a Holocaust survivor and a tiny Torah scroll that had survived Bergen-Belsen. Each astronaut brought a lifetime of training, curiosity, and personal dreams aboard Columbia. Their mission was packed with experiments, 80 in total, studying everything from atmospheric dust to the behavior of flames in microgravity. For the crew, this flight was the culmination of years of sacrifice and hope. For their families, colleagues, and the millions watching around the world, they represented the best of what human exploration could be. Columbia's legacy was never just technical. It was written in the lives and ambitions of those who flew her, and in the promise that space belonged to everyone willing to reach for it. So when a spacecraft returns to Earth, it faces a wall of air at more than 17,000 miles per hour. The friction from this speed generates temperatures that can reach over 2,300 degrees Celsius, hot enough to melt steel. To survive, the shuttle relied on a patchwork of thermal protection, white silica tiles across most surfaces, and for the most exposed areas, a material called Reinforced Carbon Carbon, or RCC. This composite covered the nose cap and the leading edges of the wings, the very front where the heat and pressure are greatest. RCC could withstand temperatures close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but it was brittle. Its strength came at the cost of impact resistance. On January the 16th, 2003, at 81.7 seconds after launch, a chunk of foam insulation broke free from the external tank. The piece measured between 21 and 27 inches long, about the size of a suitcase, and weighed just under two pounds. Traveling at more than 500 miles per hour, it struck the left wing's leading edge, slamming into RCC panel eight. The impact was violent, but from the ground, nothing seemed amiss. The shuttle continued upward, and within minutes, Columbia was in orbit. Yet the laws of physics had already set the mission on a new trajectory. The foam, though light, carried enough momentum to breach the RCC, leaving a hole roughly 16 inches across. 
this single moment, nearly invisible amid the roar of ascent, compromised the very barrier meant to shield the crew from the inferno of re-entry. The real extent of the damage would remain a mystery for the next 16 days. On flight day two, as Columbia circled the planet, NASA's debris assessment team began urgent analysis of the foam strike. The group came together in a hurry. Engineers from NASA, United Space Alliance, and Boeing, each logging their concerns and calculations in real time. Their primary tool was a software program called Crater, originally designed to predict damage from small impacts on shuttle tiles, not for breaches in reinforced carbon-carbon. Still, with no images of the wing's actual condition, the team fed in estimates and relied on Crater's output. The software, though, had never been validated for foam hitting reinforced carbon-carbon at these speeds or angles. Its underlying assumptions didn't match the reality of what Columbia had suffered. Some engineers recognized the gaps. Internal emails from the mission evaluation room show a rising sense of alarm. One structural analyst warned that the damage could burn through to the wheel well on re-entry. Others flagged the limits of Crater, noting it was never meant for this scenario. But the workflow favored consensus and precedent. Managers compared the event to earlier, less severe foam strikes, treating this as just another in-family case. The momentum of the mission, and the pressure to keep to schedule, meant dissenting voices were often sidelined. Requests for more definitive data, especially high-resolution imagery, began to surface. Yet, as the days ticked by, the damage to Columbia's left wing remained a matter of speculation, not certainty. The engineering team's warnings, buried in logs and emails, went unheeded as the mission pressed on. At 8.30 a.m. Central Standard Time on January 22nd, a NASA liaison placed a call to U.S. STRATCOM, formally cancelling the request for Department of Defense imagery of Columbia's left wing. The decision came not from the engineers urgently seeking answers, but from the highest levels of mission management. Linda Hamm, chair of the mission management team, had questioned the necessity of outside imaging. She consulted with other senior managers, who assured her that in-house resources were sufficient and that no formal engineering requirement existed for the imagery. The cancellation was logged, and the matter was considered closed. Inside NASA, the process leading to this moment was anything but straightforward. Requests for high-resolution images had come from multiple engineers, Bob Page, Bob White, Rodney Rocha, each routed informally, sometimes outside official channels, and all lacking direct managerial endorsement. When the requests finally reached the mission management team, they were seen as an optional engineering desire, not a mission-critical need. Managers cited past foam incidents and concluded that, even if new images revealed damage, there would be little that could be done to alter the mission outcome. The debris assessment team never received a direct explanation for the cancellation. Their warnings remained buried in internal emails and meeting logs, while management pressed forward with the planned science schedule. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board would later cite this episode as a textbook example of organizational blindness. CAIB's findings catalogued a culture where schedule and consensus took precedence over dissent and uncertainty, where risk was normalized and uncomfortable questions were quietly set aside. In the end, the denial of outside imagery locked in a course with no further opportunity for intervention. Columbia's fate was sealed not only by physics, but by the choices made in conference rooms and on phone lines, far from the vacuum of space. At 7.44 Central Standard Time, Columbia reached entry interface, 400,000 feet above the Pacific, racing toward the California coast. Within minutes, Flight data began to register the first signs of trouble. A temperature sensor buried in the left wing started to climb beyond expected values. As the shuttle crossed into Texas airspace, more sensors along the wing edge and inside the wheel well showed abnormal heat spikes. Hydraulic pressure lines routed through the same area began to drop. 
By 7.54, tire pressure sensors in the left main landing gear were giving off scale readings or dropping out entirely. Each failed sensor traced a silent path for plasma, superheated gas now flowing through the breach in RCC Panel 8. The data, relentless and precise, recorded Columbia's internal systems unraveling, moment by moment, long before the breakup became visible to anyone on the ground. At 8 o'clock and 59 seconds Central Standard Time, Columbia began to break apart high above North Central Texas. Radar and eyewitnesses on the ground traced a growing trail of debris against the morning scar. The orbiter, still traveling at nearly 12,000 miles per hour and over 200,000 feet up, shed fragments that glittered across a corridor stretching from Littlefield to the outskirts of Palestine. By 8.02, a major fragmentation event scattered pieces over Anderson and Nacogdoches counties. The main structure disintegrated as the shuttle lost all aerodynamic control, leaving a debris field more than 200 miles long and 20 miles wide. Analysis of radar returns and ground reports allowed investigators to reconstruct the exact breakup path, confirming that the final collapse occurred over Texas, just minutes before Columbia was due to land in Florida. On February 1, 2003, at 0744 CST, Columbia's first over-temperature alarm was recorded, tracing the start of its fatal descent. Investigations revealed that a 1.7-pound piece of foam struck the left wing just 81.7 seconds after launch, breaching the reinforced carbon-carbon panel and dooming the mission. Despite the debris assessment team's analysis and repeated requests, High-resolution imaging was cancelled on January 22, leaving the true extent of the damage unknown until re-entry. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board found that both technical failures and NASA's organizational culture contributed directly to the loss. Some internal NASA communications and decision-making details remain classified, and not all questions about risk assessment processes are fully resolved. Today, mandatory on-orbit inspections for all crewed missions are required, and shuttle flight protocols changed as a direct result of Columbia's loss. The facts are clear. A single overlooked impact, compounded by missed opportunities, changed the course of spaceflight safety forever.